How's it going, everybody? So, keeping with the recent theme that I've had of looking through the comments section to get the most asked questions and covering them in videos, there's another one that really stood out to me, even though it's not really a question. There has, however, been a sizable amount of interest in this particular topic, and it once again has me talking about the history of crocodilians. When I very briefly mentioned a fully terrestrial crocodile in my very first video on the channel, many of you who are unaware reacted with anything from fascination to horror that such a creature once walked and ran on this planet. But what's really interesting about these animals is that it's actually a trait that has evolved several separate times throughout the roughly 250 million years that this group has been around. Now, I don't want to alarm anyone, but technically speaking, all crocodiles today are capable of running and galloping on land. My buddy Edge just actually made a video showing this for like three and a half minutes straight. But the topic of today's video is going to be the times that certain branches of this family evolved into primarily land-based predators. I think I'm going to be going over them in chronological order from the earliest examples of what would count as a land croc to the most recent because each kind of play into one another and almost form a narrative of this forgotten chapter of the story of these animals and their on and off relationship with the land. But with all that out of the way, let's get into the history of the land crocs. I hope you guys can keep up with these names because we got some word salad on our plate today. So to find the first land crocs, we have to go all the way back to the dawning days of both crocodiles and dinosaurs, the Triassic. And yeah, I'm starting to wonder if I'm even going to have anything left to talk about when I get to the Triassic History of the Earth video. But either way, that is when this story starts. It's kind of cheating though, because here's the thing. The order of archosaurs that would eventually give rise to what we're familiar with as crocodiles actually started out as a terrestrial group. They're called the Pseudosuchians, a very large group that basically encompasses all of the archosaurs that are closer related to crocodiles than they are to dinosaurs and birds. The main thing that separates these two groups is their pelvic and hip bone configurations. This tells us that more than likely the first dinosaurs and the Pseudosuchians evolved their upright posture independently from one another. Yet another case of convergent evolution. Now I've talked a lot in several videos now about how the archosaurs started to branch out in the Triassic to fill the vacant niches left by the mass extinction at the end of the Permian. But the Pseudosuchians would not become the aquatic hunters that their descendants would later become famous for. Or, or at least not yet. This is because that spot was already being filled by a different group of archosaurs called the Phytosaurs. Although they are very crocodile-like, they're no more crocodiles than pterosaurs are dinosaurs. And because that role was already being filled, these first ancestors of crocodiles started to do a lot of the same things that many other groups of animals were doing across Pangaea at the time, spreading into many different species and evolving to various different lifestyles. Primarily, the Pseudosuchians split into two different lineages, the diverse and widespread Rawasuchians and the gargantuan apex predators of the Triassic, the Prestosuchids. One of the most well-known Rawasuchians is Postosuchus, and most of them followed a fairly similar body plan. They all had more blade-like teeth that was better for cutting flesh than grabbing and holding. That would become a reoccurring trait as we go forward, since these animals don't have to kill by pulling their prey underwater and drowning them. And we see the same thing in this first group of truly giant land crocodiles, the Prestosuchids. Prestosuchids itself grew up to five meters long, making it large enough to be a major predator. And Saurosuchus was even larger at up to seven and a half meters, putting it on par with Fasolosuchus, which I mentioned in one of my previous Triassic videos. This first group of land crocs set this branch of archosaurs up as the adaptable success story that they would become. And there's a lot that I didn't get to mention here, but I think I gotta save something for the History of the Earth Triassic video. Although the king land crocs like Fasolosuchus and Saurosuchus died out at the end of the Triassic, several groups of Pseudosuchians did push on. Some would go on to fill the void left by the death of the Phytosaurs and take the classic aquatic hunter role for the first time. And some would remain on the land and adapt to life alongside the ruling dinosaurs of the Jurassic and Cretaceous. Throughout the Mesozoic is when the crocodiles started to get really interesting. Besides the fact that aquatic varieties were growing to sizes that could actually feed on large dinosaurs, 
the Land Crocs branched into a new suborder called the Notosukians. And it's during this time that they started to turn into all kinds of things that barely even resemble crocs at all, like the tiny herbivorous land crocodile called Simosuchus. It was discovered in Madagascar, and it was only about three quarters of a meter long and had a short snout full of blunt teeth. This is actually where the creature gets its name, which means pugged-nosed crocodile. And then there was the armadillo croc, literally called armadillo sucus, which besides protective armor that looked more similar to glyptodons and armadillos than any actual crocodile, it had a number of other adaptations that made it more similar to mammals than reptiles. There's even a duck croc called a natosuchus. Alongside all this weirdness, the Notosukians did have a few classic examples of what you would call a land croc. One of the most notable was the South American species called Barusuchus. This four meter long carnivore competed with the abelosaurid dinosaurs like Carnotaurus for food, once again having more blade-like teeth than what we would see from its aquatic cousins. As Pangaea drifted apart during the Jurassic, a lot of the land crocs that were around during the Triassic started to get separated as Africa and South America drifted apart. At that point, the South American species like Barosuchus were able to muscle out a niche and remain as land predators. Meanwhile, in and around Africa, we started to see a lot more of these more unique and peculiar forms of crocodile. This divergence was shaped by the planet itself, as well as the competition and pressures that both groups would face as their environment changed. But regardless of how diverse and varied these crocodiles had become alongside the dinosaurs, their fate would all be the same. 66 million years ago, they would face their second major mass extinction, and many of the bizarre crocs of the Mesozoic would not survive. But a few would. Now we've already talked about how this was possible, especially for the aquatic ambush hunters, but even a few of the land crocs would pull through, and they would be the ones who would eventually turn into mammal-killing specialists. For about 20 million years following the Cretaceous mass extinction, the world became drastically warm and humid. And during this time, there was once again a lot of ecological niches that had been left vacant by the mass die-off that just took place. And this seems to have been the perfect formula for some really interesting variations in crocodiles. Because during the Paleocene and Eocene, we start to see a great deal of diversification from them on almost every continent as the world became covered in a massive tropical forest. And deep in the jungles of South America, the last remaining Notosuchians were about to take over. And without their dinosaur competitors, there was not much to stand in their way. And now they would branch into a whole new group of blade-toothed land crocs called the Sebecids. This group became the dominant land predators in South America during the Paleogene with their only competition being the forest rocket terror birds and the predatory marsupials, the sparacidonts. But early on, they also may have struggled to deal with the giant snake Titanoboa. Most of these crocs were similar in size, around two to three meters long. But as they adapted to the post-dinosaur world, a few would break this mold and become the undisputed kings of the continent. But back to them in a moment. Because despite these reptiles being hugely successful on one landmass, they would not be able to spread across the world in the same way they had during the Mesozoic. However, other crocodilians were surviving across the Northern Hemisphere. And in another case of convergent evolution, the Paleogene jungles were going to create more of the same body plan from a different branch of this family tree. This group was called the Planocranids. They spread across North America and Europe around 60 million years ago. And by the Eocene Thermal Maximum, they would be a solid force across multiple continents, long before the mammalian carnivores had a chance to stake a claim. The most well-known species from this group is known as Bovarosuchus, and this may have been, in fact, one of the most well-adapted crocs the world had ever seen for fast running on land. Because these guys had a very peculiar feature for reptiles. The claws at the end of their toes had been replaced by hooves. This gave these animals the tools that they needed to carve out a place among the rising mammals of the early Cenozoic. But this success would only last as long as the hot world persisted. The global forests and no glaciers at the poles were the perfect setting to make Eocene Earth into planet crocodile. 
the dinosaurs were gone, and the mammals and birds were struggling to compete with them, and they only had to worry about the occasional giant snake. The only thing that could really get them down was the collapse of this planet-wide Garden of Eden. But unfortunately, that's exactly what was about to happen. The second half of the Eocene started to see the ideal global climate for cold-blooded reptiles come to an end. And this also led to increasing competition from various mammal groups that were beginning to adapt to the drier, low woodland habitats that were spreading. In the Northern Hemisphere, the carnivorous groups of the Carnivorans and Creodonts were rising to the roles of ambush and pursuit predators. And as a result, the ungulates were getting progressively better and better at long distance running on more open terrain. Hell, even groups that we don't normally think of as particularly agile, like rhinos, were becoming better runners. In North America during the Oligocene, there was a species of hornless rhino called Subhyracodon that was smaller, lighter, and comparatively had longer legs than what we see today. And its common name among paleontologists was the running rhino. So with herbivores becoming better at evading predators and new mammalian carnivores to compete with, and the climate itself becoming less favorable for land crocs, it was only a matter of time before they were on their way out. By around 40 million years ago, the hoofed planocranid crocs like Bovarisuchus were gone. On the still isolated continent of South America, however, the Sebecids were still hanging on. They still had to deal with competing with the more well-known Cenozoic hunters as the terabirds became larger, but perhaps because the climate was not as badly affected? At first, at least. Or maybe because the crocs were just better at living in more arid environments, they not only lived on, but had one more big part to play in the story of life in this era. They became what must have been the undisputed kings of the continent, with the species named Barinasuchus. The fact that this animal is so unknown to the general public is pretty unfortunate considering it may have actually been one of the largest terrestrial carnivores of the Cenozoic era. Now, remains are very sparse from this animal, but from comparing things like this skull to the measurements and proportions of other, more complete Sebecids, it's believed that Barinasuchus may have been up to 7.5 meters long. This would put this animal in the same size range as some of the giant Triassic land crocs like Fasolasuchus. And this last lineage would hang on until the Miocene around 12 million years ago, when the continually cooling and drying climate appears to have finally caught up with them. But they not only made it an extra 25 million years longer than any other terrestrial crocodiles, but they also achieved sizes that make them seem more like monsters from the Mesozoic Age of Reptiles than anything from the more recent past. So despite this being a phenomenon that we don't see in any modern crocodiles today, the truth is that different varieties of these reptiles being terrestrial was actually the case for most of the roughly 250 million years that they've been around. They started out as land-based predators when the phytosaurs were still around. But once they died out at the end of the Triassic, crocs would take to the classic role that we associate them with today. And this has become a tried and true method of hunting that has been one of their secrets to success across the globe in just about every habitat. But wherever they could manage to muscle out a living on land, whether that be alongside dinosaurs or mammals, different crocodile forms would thrive in that situation as well. In the end, it was more likely the climate that made this way of life difficult for them to maintain. But as long as there are places on Earth that have large animals seeking out bodies of fresh water to drink, there will always be a niche for some kind of crocodile. And although this may seem like the end of the story of the land crocs across time, there's actually more. For you see, even after the last of the Sebecids died out in South America, the body plan of the land croc would evolve one more time in a land that is pretty well known for its crocodilians, but has been oddly missing from this story so far. But that's gonna be the topic of the next video. That's right, this one's gonna be a two-parter, because that's the only way that I feel like I could really give this next group its just exploration. I hope you all enjoyed this story of the history of land crocs. My idea is to kind of make these videos showing the evolutionary story of a specific group to get more in detail about them. There's a chance that some of these animals might get mentioned in the History of the Earth series going forward, 
but they definitely won't be able to have as much focus since I'll have to cover everything else going on during that time period. So if you guys like this idea, let me know by giving this video a like. And comment below to tell me what other groups of animals you would like to see get this sort of deep dive. I think that this is a really good format, and I hope you all enjoy it. Alright, now off to one of my low-key favorite times and places in natural history. See y'all in the next one. Bye. Thank you.